Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 132, The Death of Heroes with Christopher Dole. Yeah, we pour one out for a bunch of different heroes from a bunch of different mythologies from around the world. And it is a really, really interesting dive into kind of the unifying factors of deaths of heroes. And I would definitely pour one out for both our new patron, Morgan, welcome Morgan, and our supporting producer level patrons, Philip, Eeyore, Christy, Mercedes, Samantha, Danica, Marissa, Sammy, Josie, Neil, Jessica, and Phil Fresh. Not because they died or anything, just because they're so cool They d- oh. and they're not in our presence. They deserve yeah. to have one poured out for them. They super do. As do our legend level patrons, Kelly, Cody, Mr. Folk, Talia, Haley, James, Jess, Sarah, Sandra, Audra and Jack Marie. I'd pour out a whole bottle of champagne for all of those patrons. It would cost Aww. us a lot of money, but they're worth it. Yeah, sometimes you gotta you gotta just do the thing that is a little bit frivolous, but definitely worth it. Yeah. Speaking of pouring out drinks, um, I poured us a very nice bottle of red wine, one of my favorites, Smith and Hook. I think I've mentioned it before on the show, but it's like a really, really great Washington Cabernet Sauvignon. Highly recommend it. Please go check it out. It's delicious. Yum. And Julia, do you have any kind of uh, pairing to recommend with that red wine? Maybe a, a podcast, a book, a TV show? You know what, Amanda? I actually recently picked up, because I don't think I've ever read the first book in its entirety, but I picked up The Golden Compass for the first time. Yes! And I purchased it, and I am now four or five chapters in after buying it on Sunday, and I'm absolutely delighted. It's very good. I can see why it's one of your favorite book series. Excellent. I'm so glad to hear it. And I actually just recorded a guest episode for my friends Nicole and Mari's podcast Snark Squad about Ooh. The Subtle Knife, which is the second book in that series. Ooh, yeah, it, it seems really cool. And I feel like I'm picking up more now that I kind of know the concept of the world, especially in that first uh, two chapters where they're talking about the yeah. dust and the, the other world worlds. building just like just ratchets up like a roller coaster, man. It's amazing. I was like, with no context, I would have no idea what they're talking about, which is kind of the point. But the fact that I have even a little context makes it all the more better. Totally. And if you want to get an even richer context about what it's like to make spirits and what we think about our episodes, you should join us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash spirits podcast. You can get our behind the scenes commentary for every dang episode, including links to videos and photos and books that inspire us. You can get cocktail pairings, you can get care packages, and you can get a bonus urban legend episode every dang month. I love our bonus Urban Legends episodes. They're always an absolute delight. And I think actually my favorite Urban legend story of all time was in a bonus about a ghost diner. <gasps> yes, I remember that one. Ooh, that was so good. I still think about that sometimes when I pass like a closed restaurant on the side of the road. I'm just like, not today. Not today. You won't get me ghosts. Well, the, the ghosts can have their ghostly egg creams and their, their ghostly uh, the breakfast specials in their mm-hmm. ghost diners. They're not going to fool me because we are enjoying episode 132, The Death of Heroes with Christopher Dole. All right, listeners, this week we are joined by Christopher Dole, who is the co-creator of Arden. We have recommended the show a couple of times, I think, now on the podcast. But Christopher, welcome so much. Thank you so much. Really big fan of the show. I sort of fell in love with the uh, Taily Poe episode. (laughs) Didn't we all? Yeah. (laughs) We fell some way, Mm -hmm. fell deeper into a nightmare, fell deep into Appalachian folklore. (laughs) fell in love whatever you want to whatever you want to say one day yeah. we'll make that jack black movie one day yeah, truly uh, that was like one of the stories that scared me the most as a kid and so hearing it be like oh i wasn't alone in having the skit the shit scared out of me by this <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that we could bring the uh terrifying legacy of the tally po to so many of our listeners who are in appalachian <laughs> mm-hmm I know. Long after we're dead, Julia, people will uh, hopefully discover our MP3s on the dusty old internet yep. and be like, oh, fuck, the tail is in his belly. <laughs> so, Christopher, what are we going to be talking about this evening? Yeah, so we're going to go with sort of a broad topic, which is, uh, as I sort of discussed, we're calling it sort of the ends of myths and the deaths of heroes. 
Ooh, just such an ominous title. I really, really love it, though. <laughs> like just to get started off with a little uh, background, I'd say between the ages of uh, five and ten, the Del Larry's Book of Greek Myths was absolutely my most read book. I just went, I was just all in on sort of Greek myths and sort of also then Norse myths and myths from around the world from a very, very early age. But what specifically attracted me to this topic uh, was in 2017, when I was sort of reflecting on the, the year of film and realized that in sort of Hollywood's like big budget franchise films, film characters with a collected like close to 70 years of cinematic history died huh. in franchises that year. This is the uh, the Star Wars, uh, yeah. the Force Awakens stuff, and and yeah, all the that Last kind Jedi, of... uh, mm -hmm. Logan, the Planet of the Apes films, yeah, which is extremely unusual trend, especially with what is the more sort of like common trend, which is you've got sort of recycling and recasting and rebooting, where you get mm -hmm. sort of like five different. Spider-Man's in the last five yeah, years. Yeah, or like five different Robin Hood origins. Not even beyond have, the uh, origins, just origins. <laughs> now we have Archie from Archie Comics is in a, a fight club in prison for some reason. Yeah. I don't watch Riverdale, but every time there's an episode of Riverdale on, I go to mm -hmm. Tumblr and just go through the uh, the tag and I'm like, I wonder what's going on with that. Mm, this seems interesting. Someone's a lesbian now. That's sweet. <laughs> I've seen enough of Riverdale to understand the... the flailing about the plot that happens on Twitter, which is honestly my preferred way to experience Riverdale. <laughs> yeah, the most I know about this most recent season was that Archie got attacked by a bear. And oh, no. Fantastic. <laughs> so how did these heroes exit? Were they too pursued by bears? Was there like a commonality in their deaths? Yeah, so um, a lot of times they were sort of leaving it at a moment where the hero was sort of like this older character who has grown sort of tired and sort of grouchy and disinterested and has to be brought back in by the younger generation. And then they're allowed to die at a point where they can look back over their lives and say, yeah, I did pretty good. Okay. How much of that do you think is the movie studio's since we're talking about movies right now, trying to bring in a new generation of viewers and make the older hero relevant in some way. Yeah, I think that is sort of very much the case. And they're, of course, interested in doing a lot of franchise handoffs and say, oh, now we're going to follow this character who has gotten the the nod of respect from your parents' generation. Right. I'm just thinking of Harrison Ford in just every movie he's done in the past <laughs> five years. Yeah. You know, Harrison Ford also came into my mind, but I didn't know which film, so I didn't say anything. But I think we're we're having a moment <laughs> here, Julia. I correct. totally agree. <laughs> yes. Yes, that is definitely his thing right now. I think we get one more Indiana Jones movie before he retires from them completely. Yeah, I think I think that's his his goal, but I yeah, it also um it's also been particularly interesting at least to me, uh, thinking about this topic this year, because right now we have Endgame. Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones is ending. Those are arguably the two biggest cultural sort of touchstones, the water cooler yeah. things that we talk about yeah. right now. And I, I don't necessarily hold to the idea that gets put forward that superheroes are modern mythology. I think there there are some differences there in the kinds of purposes they serve and mm -hmm. the sort of the masters they serve. Like what? Give us like a like a 30 second gloss. Yeah. So I th Sorry, I'm just so interested. No worries. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it is the corporatization of it. And there's I'd say superheroes are halfway between mythology and soap opera. Sure. Sure. Yeah, in that there is a vested commercial interest in keeping them ongoing and keeping them in a 
sort of a permanent status quo. Okay. I don't know. I'm thinking of other, like when I think of the word hero, I think of the sort of folkloric heroes, Mm -hmm. right? Like Robin Hood, for example. And to me, he's sort of like divorced from time. Like he's timeless. Mm -hmm. Don't know when he lived. Don't know when he died. You hear stories of him popping up all over the place. Uh, And so to me, that's why when you talk about the death or the end of a hero, Mm -hmm. um, I, it's just sort of like never a thing that had occurred to me apart from, you know, Maui dying in a, in a vagina, but yeah, that's the way to die. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. That, that was one of the more memorable exits. Um, <laughs> yeah. Though, though Robin Hood, actually the sort of the traditional ending is that he is betrayed by a woman and dies in a church and fires a last arrow to mark where his grave will be mood oh that's how i want to go yeah it's a it's a good way to go out <laughs> all things considered i don't think you want to die in a church julia i really i don't. mean like an abandoned church that's like very creepy yeah it's ruined. an abandoned church in the middle of sherwood forest what more could you possibly want i'm getting very cursed child vibes and that's all i'm gonna say for those who have seen cursed child. i'm seeing it <laughs> next week Oh, boy. Hey. Enjoy. Well, Julia, think about you dying in an abandoned church when you see it. <laughs> I will. I will always think about <laughs> me dying in abandoned churches. Yeah, just sort of shop around and figure out which one is, uh, mm. which one's the best one. Like, if I shot an arrow from this abandoned church, would my grave be in a nice place? That mm-hmm. would really determine whether or not that's the abandoned church for me. We're getting mm-hmm. very off topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just appreciate the return of the arrow motif because he could have just died in the spot where he wanted to be buried. That would have saved them, or like like two feet to the left. Yep. That would have saved everybody a lot just of trouble. Roll. Yeah, he's like, no, he's just committed to this to the very end. This was my thing and I will stick to it. <laughs> but okay, back to heroes dying for real this time. Yeah, so I picked out uh, five stories that sort of like from around the world that I thought were some of the most interesting ones in terms of what the ends of their story said about the character and how the storytellers, you know, what they wanted that final message to be. Like, what was the grand overall point of this? Mm -hmm. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go back to ancient Sumeria. Ah, my fave. Yeah, to uh, some poems from about 2100 BC. Yes. About a f- oh, poems. Yeah, about a fellow named Bilgamesh. Or, oh. as he's been discussed in great depth and with great thought on this show, Gilgamesh. Yeah. There's about five poems that from Sumeria that predate the... Uh, the 12 tablets that we know as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, Those come from later Babylonian and Akkadian uh, traditions that have sort of been the translations of these poems. The one we're going to specifically talk about is a poem called The Great Wild Bull is Lying Down. (laughs) Yeah, at this point... uh, Bilgames is, he's an old man. His journeys with Enkidu are sort of long behind him. And the time has come for him to die. He is not happy about it, even though um, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh is very much about sort of coming to accept death as a thing that will come for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. As the uh, the days grow short, no, Bilgames is relapsing a bit well, into yeah, his I old think, self. I think it's easy when you're very young and vivacious to be like, yeah, death will come to me eventually. But when you're like starting to feel it for real, that's when you're like, mm, actually, I don't like this. Not a huge fan. Yeah. The key here is that he must learn that even though he is a demigod, he is still part mortal and in a dream Enlil the father of the gods comes to him and tells him "O Bilgames I made your destiny a destiny of kingship but I did not make Mm. it of eternal life damn also a very polite way to be like are you not satisfied (laughs) did I not do enough 
Yeah, uh, that is that is basically the message that Enlil gives to him is that you had a great life. You were a hero whose stories will be told for hundreds and thousands of years. Your name will live on. But whoever is born mortal, whether they be beggar, whether they be king, you will die. Do not go down to the underworld with your heart knotted in anger. Oof. Hmm. After this pep talk, uh, and also learning that he will be gifted a position of judge in the underworld, which, hmm. you know, <laughs> like Not out bad. of respect. Not bad. loves judging people. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's like, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of um, nominate, sort of like respecting the part of him that is a demigod that will sort of live on there. Gilgamesh accepts his death hmm. and passes on. And then the he is buried uh, in the Euphrates. Yeah. Nice. Just like in Kedu. Mm-hmm. I know. Long but some buddies forever. Other. Yeah. Yeah. You wanna get Amanda, do you wanna get buried next to each other? Um, I think that'll be pretty complex given our, our families and partners and, sure. and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but uh if possible, I think we could have a very cool like train a sort of tree to like grow betwixt the graves mm. so it's like an archway and then it has like dangly vines and or moss ideally cool. and people think it's cursed and we're like you're not wrong <laughs> perfect thank you thank you for expanding on my idea and making it better that's a great spin on the family tree there <laughs> oh yeah the family tree looks like witch's hands and we are here for it <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i think sort of that poem and then how it's ultimately translated into the tablets it's so fascinating that this is this is basically the first story this is the first grand epic that humanity told and it's all about coming to accept the inevitability of death no matter who you are even if you are someone as grand as Gilgamesh yeah totally Especially because for the first half of the tablet, Enkidu's the point of view character. It's his mm -hmm. hero's journey, whereas Gilgamesh is the guy we're supposed to be in awe and terror of. And then when Enkidu dies, that then the story becomes about Gilgamesh struggling to accept it. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing that he struggles with up until the very end when he is lucky enough to literally get his ass kicked a little by the father of the gods. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Which I appreciate because that that's how death feels, right? It's like a, a story that you are centered on and you didn't think would ever end. And then suddenly as a, as a reader, you're like wrenched out of that narrative and kind of left to pick up the pieces. I, I just think it's a really fascinating kind of like meta textual choice. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So after the legacy of Gilgamesh, what story comes next? So next, we're going to go to Greece. Of course. And we're going to talk about a complicated man. Oh, boy. That, that could be literally anyone in Greek mythology. Let's be real here. I was going to yeah. say, are there any who aren't? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about Odysseus, which yeah. I say, yeah, the Odyssey was like my myth. As a kid, like I had this Derek Jacobi read audiobook that <laughs> I just devoured and listened to over and over again. And also, a lot of credit here goes to the Odyssey episode of Wishbone. <laughs> That's very oh good. Oh my god. I haven't Wishbone, thought about Wishbone though. in a very long time. We should just stop the podcast and rewatch Wishbone professionally. Cool. Sounds good. Sounds good. Why is there not a Wishbone fan cast? I bet there is. Yeah, why don't you have a Wishbone podcast on Multitude? Give me my Wishbone cottage industry. <laughs> All right, we'll table this idea, return to it after the episode. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. cool. <laughs> the Odyssey was like, I was so in on Odysseus as a kid and like, oh, he's so smart and he does all these things. And then like part of the experience of growing up is when you realize, oh, your heroes aren't great. And mm -hmm. sort of coming to realize the negative sides of his journey particularly his relationships with women and yeah. what we're going to talk about here is a follow-up on his relationship with Circe because of the literature that has survived 
we think of Odysseus as the one Greek hero who gets a happy ending. Mm -hmm. He makes it back. He lives out his life with Penelope and with his son. And, you know, he's had his great epic journey and he gets to settle down. But that was not the case for the Greeks. No, the, the Greeks never rest. No. It's never no. a happy ending for the Greeks. No. So this is like always like the thing that you thought you did and finished comes back to haunt you. Mm hmm. With yeah, the classic uh, Greek tragedy ending. So there's a lost epic poem known as the Telegony. It's supposed to be by a poet named Eugamon, though he might have stolen it. Uh, there, hmm. Sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's also a uh, lost play by Sophocles called Odysseus and Canthoplex. Sort of like, and the fact that it's like in this many different sources from this many different authors over the years. Like, this was the canonical death of Odysseus mm. at the time. Like, un hubris will undo every man, even the greatest of heroes story. When Odysseus leaves Circe behind, what he doesn't realize is that he's gotten her pregnant. His son, Telegonus, uh, grows up with Circe. He wants to go meet his father. And Circe gives him this special sp spear made out of a stingray's hook. Oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. so the, probably my favorite kind of weapon is made out of a stingray. Mm -hmm. I don't That's know pretty why. badass. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so Telegonus, and at this point in the story, he wants to meet his father. He's not going there necessarily to kill him. Mm. Well, that's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, however, uh, he kind of gets lost on the way. Mm. When he uh, arrives at Ithaca, he doesn't think he's in Ithaca. He thinks he's in one of Ithaca's enemies. And okay. he starts plundering it, thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to bring my dad treasure from his enemies. Uh, you should probably confirm the city you're in before you start plundering, just my dude. wants approval. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, of course, Odysseus and Telemachus go out to see, hey, who's this asshole plundering our city? We're, we're like the rulers. We're going to defend it. Mm -hmm. And Odysseus is killed. Uh, Odysseus. By who? By uh, Telegonus. Yeah. Oh. Accidentally takes that uh, stingray spear to the heart. And... Accidentally. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then Telegonus learns that he's killed his father. And then in a recompense, Circe makes Penelope and Telemachus immortal, marries Telemachus, and Telegonus marries Penelope, and they all go off to live happily ever after on Circe's island. Huh. Well, not the ending I would have thought happened, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that one threw in a couple twists there at the end. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, marrying people that maybe you shouldn't be marrying and, uh, yeah. and some immortality thrown in in the middle, you know. Yeah, kind of, honestly, it kind of works out for everyone except Odysseus. Yeah, but also Odysseus did some shit, so I'm not yeah. like I'm not like upset about him dying. I there I can't name a single Greek hero that doesn't have a somewhat tragic ending after their main story is finished, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's so I think it's it's interesting because that story's lost. Mm -hmm. We don't think of Odysseus as one of those. We think of him as the exception. Yes, and I think I said that in an episode, and then someone sent me a correction about that. I was like, I've literally never heard that story before, but <laughs> awesome. I'm glad he kind of dies. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, because I, you know. Mm -hmm. I obviously don't have an expert understanding of uh, Greek, mytholo Greek mythology, but it does seem to me to be like a, you know, reinforcing the motif that no one is above human error. Mm -hmm. You know, that like the the gods are like us, Human beings are predictable in some ways. We can't really escape the fates. Uh, and it, it makes sense that someone like Odysseus, whose life is, is you know, so defined by, like, a comedy of errors mm -hmm. and bad mistakes leading to more bad situations, that, I mean, he, he sh he's not going to live out happily ever after, you know? It's just not in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's like even someone who was protected by the gods and shepherded by them through all of these trials and decades of struggling, even he can die just like that in a mistake. 
It, it feels very... The Greeks love the, oh, the classic misunderstanding that ends in the death of a king. Mm-hmm. I know. I was going to say that seems like an unexpected ending, but truly, like, the death of a king and incest is is definitionally ancient Greek. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the... Uh, and actually, the the poet uh, Yugaman, uh, his his name translates to happy marriage, and so it's <laughs> thought that was his like gimmick pen oh, name. My yeah. dude, what yeah. are you doing? Yeah. So, I mean, this was a quite a choice of of that. For, you know. It's like if I someone respect. was named like something something good wife, and they only wrote Hallmark romances. <laughs> I really love it a lot. It's like it's like drag names before drag names. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Who do we have up after Odysseus then? Okay, so now we're going to cross the uh, Atlantic, and uh-huh. we're going to talk about a fellow named Redhorn. Yeah, he's from the Iowa and Ho Chunk tribes. And, All right. Yeah, and he actually has a couple of different names. He's only known as red horn in I believe the Iowa tradition uh, there's a number of traditions where he is known as sort of variations on he who wears faces on his ears mm. he who wears Ooh. human heads on his earlobes human head earrings you know the faces on the ears sounded a lot more poetic but as the names went on <laughs> i kind of got the drift it got a little too <laughs> literal a little too quickly yeah 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 he has faces on his earlobes <laughs> cool I mean, I respect it. So tell us a little mm-hmm. bit about him. Yeah, so he is one of five savior figures sent down by the creator to make the world safe for the least of his creations, humankind. Interesting. Yeah, and he is the fourth of these five. And there's actually theories that he wears faces on his ears entered these myths late because at the end of the story, he's the only one of the five not given a special domain to rule. Hmm. Like Bilgamesh, like uh, Odysseus, he has a number of adventures. Most of them are set against the giant man-eaters. Uh, Redhorn fights many contests against them, including uh, a game of lacrosse where the faces on his ears make the giant's best player, who's this great tall woman with red hair, laugh so much that the giants lose and he marries her. Wow, love that. Oh. Into that. Very, very Why can't good. all myths be like that? Yeah. More laughter than expected and a marriage. <laughs> and laughter, a game of giant lacrosse. Women. Like... Laughter, giant women, lacrosse, marriage. All four things I want in my life. Ultimately, uh, the giants challenge Redhorn, his friend Turtle, and his friend Storms as he walks uh, to a wrestling contest with life index stakes. And oh, don't do that. Bad, yeah. bad choice. Yeah, sort of like a winner takes all where you have to win a majority to triumph. And Mm-mm. Turtle wins so decisively that he kills his opponent. Whoa, Turtle coming mm. in through the clutch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then Redhorn and Storms as he walks lose. Oh, no. Yeah, so oh, they're, all, they're all killed by the giants. But Redhorn's two wives were pregnant and they give birth and their sons find where the giants are keeping the heads of the dead men and bring them back to life and kill all the giants and turtle and storms as he walks give the boys weapons but redhorn does not instead saying i have no weapon to give you yet i have given you of myself as i see that you are just like me Hmm. oh i like that Mm mm-hmm yeah. This whole conceit is a little bit Game of Thrones season seven, but <laughs> I I really respect that. And it's it's true of parenting, right? Like all, all we can give our, we can give our kids or try to give them all the stuff in the world. But at the end of the day, like the only thing that you're sure to pass on is a bit of yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I say as if I'm a parent. Uh, no, <laughs> I just, I, I have parents and I've gone to a lot of therapy. So <laughs> it's a beautiful uh, line and it's, you know, it's a, uh, a really interesting story because i think first because of that parental angle but also you know he is you know redhorn ultimately fails in his mission to conquer all the bad spirits right and yet he is still able to be a great hero it doesn't diminish his accomplishments it 
doesn't diminish what he's able to pass on to his children. You know, he's still venerated at, mm-hmm. in these stories and myths as an admirable figure. Yeah, I appreciate a hero who could fail and die and still be respected. Mm-hmm. You know, definitely. Yeah, that, um, you know, that he fails is is sad, <laughs> but it doesn't make what he did worthless. And I think, uh, uh, I feel like a lot of myths miss that. I think a lot of people miss that. Like, yeah. that's something that I, yeah. I should probably work on a little bit too through therapy and self-reflection and everything like that. The idea that just because I fail at one thing one time does not make everything else I do worthless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's almost like this is the metaphor that really helps that sink in a little bit for me. Like if you never like they say for college, right, that if you don't get rejected from a college and you probably didn't apply to, you know, big enough colleges or, or you know, stretch colleges enough. Uh, and, and I try to feel that way for life, too. Like if I never try stuff that I fail at or things that I'm bad at, mm-hmm. then I'm probably not reaching enough or trying to expand enough. Yet. Yeah. So I don't know if that's if that's just my own brain trick. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think I think that's that's really good. The one that sort of I used was when a few years ago when I was sort of unemployed and I was looking for work and sort of getting a lot of rejections. It was like, you know, you don't need 60 jobs. You need one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the right, like 10,000 ways how not to make a light bulb, mm-hmm. right? Isn't that the, the aphorism attributed to Edison? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that sounds about right. <laughs> well, before we move on to our next story, why don't y'all join me in the kitchen for a refill? Let's go. Amanda, sometimes I don't sleep good. I know I this know. is a very common thing that I've talked about many times on the podcast, but sometimes no sleep good. And sometimes you do sleep really well, and then you wake up like, whoa, this makes such a difference. Why can't I have this all the time? Damn it. Oh my gosh, yes. And when those nights happen where I have slept very, very well, usually it's because of calm. Yes, I love falling asleep to calm sleep stories, to their soundscapes, and to wake up actually to their daily meditations. Yes. So Calm is the number one app for sleep. And honestly, sleep deficiency causes some serious damage to your your body and your brain. And it's just, it's not good. So Calm has a whole library of programs designed to help you get the sleep that your brain and body needs. They have soundscapes and over a hundred of those sleep stories that you mentioned, Amanda, narrated by some really, really soothing voices like Jerome Flynn from Game of Thrones, which is so weird, but also fantastic. I love it. And my favorite narrator is called Eric Bra, and he <gasps> looks like a like a, a Thor casting call uh, person and reads all the stories about rivers and trains, which are my two favorite things. I do love a good river. I'm not as wild about trains just because I grew up commuting and God, that's true, I that's don't true. like a commuter train. But this is like trains that go across Europe and Asia and they're like beautiful and scenic and there's like the Cornish Riviera Express and it's super posh and beautiful. I love the ideal of the train. Yes. Just not the reality of the train. Yeah. Yeah. You want you want a leisure train, not a work train. Yeah. And when I think about leisure trains, they're quite relaxing and they help me get to sleep. Absolutely. So if you want to listen to some of these stories or take advantage of the many other things that Calm offers, you can go to calm.com slash spirits for 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which unlocks all those sleep stories, soundscapes and meditations. Yep. That's calm.com slash spirits, C-A-L-M dot com slash spirits. 40 million people have downloaded Calm, so you can find out why by going to calm.com slash spirits. Amanda, I love cooking. It's probably one of the best ways that I use to de-stress. Mm-hmm. So the fact that HelloFresh delivers step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients right to my door makes it so much easier and takes all of the stress out of cooking that could possibly be there. So my stress-free thing is now even more stress-free. Thank you, HelloFresh. That's great. I used to be able to do my laundry and go to the grocery store whenever I dang well pleased. But now that we have an office, I am like, oh, right, that's that's difficult to do. And having the food just sent right to me and get home, pick it up, it stays cold in its box. And then I can make a meal that's like healthful and fulfilling, makes me feel like I've done something for myself and not just kind of come home and like flopped into bed. It's really nice. Yeah. And the best part is it's a really simple process. So HelloFresh does all the meal planning for you. They do the shopping 
prepping. They do the prepping so you can focus on yourself rather than all the things that you have to get done. And another great part is they deliver seasonal, simple recipes and pre-measured ingredients. So it gets delivered right to your door. The food, like tastes like I'm not having heavy pasta sauces in the middle of summer. That's fantastic. Like they're really thinking about the foods that are in season and what's going to taste good in the time that we're in. Yeah, there was a like summer squash uh, pork rice bowl the other week. Mm. And I am making that like almost every night now. Like I bought all the ingredients for myself and I've put it into my kind of regular rotation. Never a thing I would have tried on my own. But genuinely, it's delicious squash and a soup and Squash and zucchini are amazing, and thank you, HelloFresh. Yeah, and as you and I get busier and busier, HelloFresh keeps that in mind. So all of their meals take about 30 minutes max, and they usually have only one or two pots and pans as part of putting together the menu, and so that requires minimal cleanup, and now I'm not left like hours after trying to clean up a bunch of bunch of dishes. Absolutely, and you can actually get $80 off your first month of HelloFresh at HelloFresh.com slash spirits. 80 with the code spirits 80. That's so much money. That's like that's like receiving eight meals for free. Wow, that's totally true. You can get $20 off your first four boxes, which is $80 off your first month of HelloFresh at HelloFresh.com slash spirits 80 using the code spirits 80. And Julia, with our with our uh, sleep in mind, with our bellies full, we are able to put our full brain and creativity to whatever we want to do. And a lot of the time, building a new project or strengthening a project or a brand that you already have is so important to have an online identity that is consistent and that makes people remember what you want them to remember about what it is that you do. For me, a huge part of that is a domain name. Buying Multitude.Productions through Hover was, for me, the moment when it really became real. And the best part about owning your own domain name versus getting it through like a web host is that even as your business changes and evolves, you're able to retain control over your brand. So let's say you switch web hosts or you switch website providers, you're able to assign that domain wherever you want and not go through like a laborious process of transferring it to a different provider. With Hover, you control your information, your privacy, your registrations, all of that. The nice part too about Hover is they offer a bunch of different options right? It's not just the .com or the .org or the .net. We got .productions. How cool is that? It's very, very cool. They also have free who is privacy. That means that if someone looks up the, the like, information about that domain name. Usually you have to put in your like home address and phone number, which is not stuff that you necessarily want to do if you are like a private person living on the internet. So they have free who is privacy, which other domain providers tend to do as like an upcharge. But for Hover, they know it's really important. So they include it in every purchase. Yeah. So you can go to hover.com slash spirits and get 10% off your first purchase of a domain name. Do it. It's very cool. You want that website. It's very cool and fun. It feels like I shouldn't be allowed to do this, but I can. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. That's hover.com slash spirits for 10% off your first purchase. Thanks. So the next story we're going to talk a little bit about, because this is a lengthy story, is the story of... Give me an aperitif. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So this story is the story of Draupadi, the heroine of the Mahabharata. Mm. Ooh. Yeah, Draupadi is, um, she is a woman who emerges from a fire fully grown. Already such an entrance. I love it. Yeah. And there's a sort of great contest to win her hand. And Arjuna, the third brother of the Pandavas, wins. Uh, but when he and his four brothers went home with her to see their mother, Kunti, they tell her that Arjuna has returned with excellent alms. And their mother, without looking, tells them to share the alms. So she ends up married to all five brothers. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Listen, it, it can work. It can work. Okay. Let's let's not reserve judgment. It is a myth, so probably it won't, but let's just see. <laughs> well, no, it it wasn't judgment, more of a that wasn't the intended thing. Um yeah. bad. Yes, yeah, that uh, was definitely unintended consequence. Yeah, maybe the first takeaway there is clarity of communication can be important sometimes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. She becomes the empress of their empire. She runs the economy and treasury and Whoa. citizen Okay, going outreach. better than we thought. We didn't see that coming. Yeah, she she's doing real well. There's another ruler named uh, Duryodhana who is insulted by 
her in some stories. In some stories, it's the brothers after he sort of blunders into an illusion at their palace and falls into a pool. And they laugh at him because, hey, here's this great crown prince who just walked right into a pool. I too would laugh. He tricks the Pandavas into a game of rig dice. And this next name, I have been practicing the pronunciation. I am going to mess it up. Welcome to spirits. We don't pronounce anything right ever. <laughs> Late on us. Yeah. Yudhisthira, the uh, oldest brother of the Pandavas, he loses everything in round after round, including his brother's own freedom, his own freedom. And oh, no. Yeah. Ultimately, Draupadi. Wow. However, when she arrives at the court, she is defiant. She is like raising legal questions of if her husband already lost himself, did he have the right to bet her? Like Ooh. things like that. And just like, I will not submit to this ruling. And I love her. Mm -hmm. When Duryodhana gets so angry with her that he orders his servant, who is Dushana, her own brother in law, to disrobe her in front of the court, she prays to Krishna for protection, and Dushana is unable to disrobe her because her sari keeps getting longer and longer until he collapses from exhaustion. Whoa, that's so good. That's amazing. Yeah. And then the queen mother arrives, and Draupadi is granted boons by her, and with she's granted two boons. One is securing the one husband who she'd have a son with, freedom so that her son is not a slave yeah. then she secures the other brother's freedom and then when asked about her own freedom she says it was not her place to ask for it and is granted it ah, smart be humble mm -hmm. yeah i love it yeah and then like war breaks out uh there is a legend that in the war she uh washes her hair in the blood of the man who attempted to disrobe her in front of the court fuck so, yeah. yes yeah, the, that's that's not in the original Mahabharata. That is added later. Still a good addition. This is some, mm -hmm. this is some Amanda and Julia bait right mm -hmm. here. Yeah. yeah, and then ultimately the Pandavas decide to retire from the world and climb the Himalayas to heaven. And she joins them. Unfortunately, she passes away as the first one oh, no. to do. Yeah, but while... Too good for this world. Well, they're... There's something coming here. <laughs> oh, I pulled an Amanda <laughs> where I guessed something ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So while her husbands believe that the reason she passed away was because she suffered the sin of partiality that kept her from heaven, when the one husband, Yudhisthira, who is the only one to reach heaven on the climb, he's told that she and his other brothers who died on the climb have already achieved heaven and are waiting for him there. And she is revealed to be an avatar of Shakti, the divine <gasps> feminine. Ooh, that's so good. I love that so much. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing story. And I highly recommend uh, reading the essay for dangerouswomenproject.org about, about Draupadi uh, by... See, it is... Uh, by Naomi Appleton, um, and it is the the title is "Why Is Draupadi a Dangerous Woman?" and mm. gender politics in ancient Hindu epic literature. I'm gonna pull that up and read it tomorrow. Adding it to my pocket right now. <laughs> um, yeah, but she's such a remarkable character because she is. You know, she's fiery, she's passionate, she will not keep quiet even though she is doubted, abducted, treated as alms, like, and then she fans, find, she keeps finding a way to not be sort of taken over by her circumstances, but to make her circumstances work for her. Yeah. To mm -hmm. not just sort of rise above, but sort of take all of those things into her and sort of become greater than the sum of those parts. Well put. Dang. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and then ultimately she's revealed to be a personification of the divine maternal. And it's a 
it's a extraordinary ending because you know so often in these old myths you'll get the story of like going back to Gilgamesh the male demigod figure who after death is sort of gets to live on as that divine self but this I think is such a powerful version of that traditional mythic story and what a cinematic ending too like at the top of the himalayas you know talking to heaven that's wow yeah there's also a pretty sort of delightful detail that when yudhisthira reaches there he the one companion that has uh survived the climb with him is his dog and he insists the dog get to come along and it does oh yes all dogs go to heaven just when you thought this myth couldn't get any better, there's pups. <laughs> it's the best story, I think, so far. I really enjoy that one. So I think you mentioned you brought five stories for us. Yes. What is the last one? So the last one, we are going to Denmark. And Ooh, not what I expected. Always a good start. <laughs> and we're going to talk about a fellow named Amleth. All right. He's the son of the king, Horwendel. And... Horwendel has this sort of jealous, evil brother named Fengon. And when Amleth is a child, Fengon publicly murders Horwendel and takes the throne. And the Uh. question on everyone's mind is, well, when Amleth grows up, clearly he's going to get revenge because that is the thing that is in style. That is the thing to do. That's what one does. Like taxes and stuff, whatever, but also Mm -hmm. revenge. Yeah. Yeah, what uh, Amleth ultimately does to, you know, because he thinks, well, you know, Fengon knows that's what's expected of me. So I should probably figure out a way to not have him kill me first, even though I'm a kid. It's like, dude, kill this brother publicly. He's not going to have many scruples here. (laughs) True. He's not like, oh, yes, a child can't murder that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just team pro murder. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So. What Amleth does is he plays foolish because everyone, you know, because it's like, well, if he thinks I'm an idiot, then, you know, that will mean I'm no threat to him. And over the years, he just acts like a complete fool and Fengon, you know, rightly suspicious (laughs) is like, you know, I'm going to keep testing this. First, I'm going to send a woman to, like, tempt him. Then I'm going to send a person to spy on him. But Amleth sees through uh, the woman and the spy he kills, cuts up, feeds to the pigs. Like you do. Oof a doof. Yeah. And then uh, what Fengon ultimately decides to do is I'm going to send him to England with a couple of my guys who will tell the English king who's my vassal to uh, kill kill the kid for me. This is getting very so Hamlet, Hamlet very close. Okay, good. Ben and I are on the same page here. <laughs> I mean, Shakespeare probably used this as source material, am I right? Yeah, that's, that's what we're getting to. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so... Where's the mom jealousy? Come on. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what happens actually is that he goes to England convinces the English king to kill his uncle's servants, woos the king's daughter, returns to Denmark, stabs his uncle, and becomes king. Tight. Yeah. And then uh, he, there's some old stories where he then sub- subsequently dies in battle. However, there's an English author named Bell Forrest who was the first one to translate this story into English, mm-hmm. who has his death at the hands of a Scottish queen who had promised to slay all her wooers. <laughs> yes. So at the time, in the like late 1500s, this story was being used as basically a don't trust women sort of like <sighs> telltale. It was had it been sort of perverted into that. And we would not remember this story at all if... Shakespeare didn't rescue it from that. Ha ha ha. Shakespeare made it better. Mm-hmm. A little bit. <laughs> wow, I never would have guessed that that was the... I mean, there's obviously some issues with women in Hamlet, but 
it didn't feel like that was the logical conclusion to that story. Mm-hmm. And it is, I think, such an interesting example of how a story can change depending on who's telling it. Because, yeah. yeah, the initial Amleth story is basically, it's a it's basically a Danish fan fiction of the uh, Lucius Brutus story from Roman mythology, where there's an, a wicked uncle who kills the father and the nephew must grow up to avenge him. It's like mm-hmm. this, huh. yeah, this story is re- replicated in a l- lot of cultures over the world. But this particular iteration nearly just became a footnote until it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Shakespeare. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rescuing another piece of history. Mm-hmm. And teaching us how to say schoon. schoon. <laughs> Amanda, every, t- every once in a while, Amanda gets so mad because I remind her that we did a production of Macbeth and the guy got the thing right the entire time. And then the last line, to see his crowned at scone. Schoon. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> And that's and the, the literal out. last line of the oh show. I had gosh. no more sound cues. <laughs> At least on the last night, you don't have to take notes on what has to change for yeah. tomorrow because it's yes. the last night. <laughs> My right stage managers, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a tour. We hit all over the world. We hit so many kinds of deaths. I love how many mythology archetypes there are here. Mm-hmm. Both stories we can predict, <coughs> Odysseus, and ones that we can't. <laughs> Yeah. Also, Odysseus. Oh, God ways. damn it, Odysseus. Just a category of his own in so many ways. Yes. Yes, indeed. I feel like I have to reread Cersei now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really do. You know that Lush started a book club and their first pick was Cersei? That oh, makes so like, much sense. Well done. <laughs> good job, Lush. Good bath bombs and good choice in books. All right. So, Christopher, thank you so much for giving us this uh, tour and opportunity to talk about deaths of heroes with you. It was so good. Yeah. Thank <laughs> Thank you. No, it's uh, it was a real, real pleasure to be here. I've been such a such a big fan of the show. It was it was great to be able to just talk about anything, let alone this. Yeah, I was Hang so on, excited. I don't think we made a Harry Potter reference yet, so let's just get one in before you leave. <laughs> any any takers? Uh, uh, hmm. Let's see here. I... Maybe Hermione as an instantiation of competent women who take their circumstances and turn them mm-hmm. for the better. Um, yeah. I think that Minerva McGonagall was probably that Scottish queen who was murdering all of her <laughs> Yes, suitors. Julia. Cool, cool, cool. cool. Yeah. Okay, we got yeah, it. Yeah, Amleth yeah. okay. could have really used the invisibility cloak in that case. Seriously. Could have used those Deathly Hallows. <laughs> Well, I wanted to give you, Christopher, the full Spears experience. We talked about high school theater. We uh, made lots of references. I misheard something. And uh, here we are Perfect. with our Harry Potter mm-hmm. reference. So Getting now you in. have your full scout badge. Yeah. Getting it in under the bell. There we go. <laughs> now, mm-hmm. and listeners, I hope you share with us on Twitter your favorite examples that we might not have hit today of deaths of heroes. And we will tag Christopher in our tweet and you can share with all of us your favorite stories. Mm-hmm. Look forward to reading those. <laughs> now, the important part. Tell us tell us about the things you make. Plug your stuff. Yeah. So I am the co-creator of Arden, a rom-com workplace com queer well queer rom-com workplace com set behind the scenes at a true crime show where each season is our take on a different shakespeare play and season two is going to be hamlet it did take me five episodes to realize that the first season was with romeo and juliet and that was embarrassing to me still (laughs) (laughs) i mean to be clear that's like half of all movies these days (laughs) yeah Fair and valid. Yeah. Also, yeah. season two being Hamlet, I am so excited for. Yeah, no, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. Like how season one was kind of a serial type true crime prod. This season is gonna be like a S Town up and vanished type, but better actually, than S Town. We have a lot of opinions on S Town, and those <laughs> are going to come through Good. In this season. <laughs> Sounds like spirits bait. If I ever heard it. Mm-hmm. And then where can people find you specifically on the internet? Yeah, so you can find me specifically at at Crystal86 on Twitter. Um, then you can find uh, Arden at, at ArdenPod and ArdenPodcast.com and Tumblr and uh, Instagram, all of those. <laughs> yeah, places. I want to reiterate how good the show is. It's funny and 
heart wrenching at the same time. And it is such a great twist on the uh, true crime culture of podcasting. So highly recommend it. Please go check it out. It is a great, great show. Thank you. Thank you so much. (laughs) And Julian, no matter what they tell you on all those true crime podcasts, the thing you have to remember is to stay creepy and stay cool. Thank you to our sponsors at calm.com slash spirits. You can get 25% off a calm premium subscription at hellofresh.com slash spirits 80. You can get $20 off your first four boxes. That's 80 bucks off your first month of HelloFresh with the code spirits 80 and at hover.com slash spirits. You'll receive 10% off your first purchase of a domain name. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.